choosing to be a developer is actually one of the best choices you can make. If your heart is truly in this, and this is something that you enjoy working in technology, this and it motivates you and you feel like your life is better because of it, everything will follow naturally. If I was going to transition from zero experience to technology, I think the first thing you should do is Hello, 大家，我的频道终于有嘉宾啦！一九年六月底的时候，我发了第一支视频，分享我自学转码的经验。到现在呢，就刚刚好满三年。那现在的我呢，已经在美国做自由开发者了。不知道我的经历大家有没有听腻了？那由于我的分享呢，是过度依赖于我的个人经历，不一定跟正在看的你会有太多的共鸣。我也发现很多小伙伴对我在美国转码啊、求职的经历非常感兴趣，所以今天呢，就邀请到几位有 IT 行业背景的朋友来给大家分享一下。这期视频的干货真的很。多很多，那三连走起来好吗？那我们今天的主角呢，有同样和我一样是自学转码的前端工程师 Mike， 资深的 IT 招聘师 Kent， 以及专门从事 IT 语言培训的英语老师 Tom。What do you think is the most important for people who want to transition into Python? I think the first thing you should do is you should work on some side projects in areas that you're interested. Of course, you should be constantly learning, developing、uh, your own skill sets, and also looking at opportunities to work for potentially free if you can't get a job. And I would highly recommend checking out Angelus.co or some of these types of,、um, or using LinkedIn, focusing on small companies and companies that you're really like passionate and interested around working with. So I highly recommend approaching some. Those founders and those startups, you know, like for example,、uh, a Series A or a Series B, and having conversation about、um, assisting and learning and getting involved. And then after that, you'll you'll get some experience. I highly recommend look at doing some freelancing and you know going to Upwork or Fiverr or there's there's many different platforms and and just getting some experience. When I got confident, I had CSS, JavaScript, React. I had done some projects, mostly front applications. During my interview, actually, I talked about basically I think this is the the best way to learn. Just like learn the theory and then you try to build like release. Small project. You don't have to make it complicated. You need to keep the relevance. Selecting side projects that support that direction. You know, it might be the technology language or the type of project. I think like that's more efficient. But but in saying that, like as an employer, I I look for people who are doing different things and are interested and intrigued、um, and curious about learning different things. So sometimes it doesn't have to. It just has to be something that you can show and justify. It's like let's say there's like one Apple Stack project. So like Node.js and MongoDB on the back end and on the front end React.、Uh, Uh, JavaScript. That's like the biggest one. Yeah, other projects were quite small. Mostly just for instance, like one project I did because I wanted to solidify my Redux knowledge. So I decided to build to build a small project. Also, like a employee website using just pure HTML and CSS. How did you learn all the skills? Is this YouTube? No, actually, I try to avoid YouTube. I was just watching videos about what's the most popular language, you know, stuff like that. But I use books. I really like this、uh, publisher. It's called No Starch Press. They have really good books. Also, Udemy courses. I never read books. And for me, it's impossible to learn from reading like texts. I have to watch all the YouTube videos. I get all the information from YouTube and other video channels. Yeah, actually, there's like one YouTube channel called Freak Out Camp. I、oh, think、yes. that one, really good one. Yeah. yeah. How long did it take you to? Learn all these things before you start to apply for jobs. For me,、uh, it took around a year. It took me about、like, two or three years before I was confident to apply for a job. Maybe that depends on the area where you live. So that's actually very important. I heard that there are people who got jobs after three or like four months of studying. The most helpful thing was having the right mindset. I wasn't super passionate about it, but I was dedicated and I was disciplined. So every day I was learning something new and I was trying to stick to a schedule because if you don't have a schedule, you just tend To procrastinate, I was like waking up at 7 a.m. every day, just doing you know the learning. I keep a journal and just like what I learn and what kind of problems I have because it really keeps me in check. Nobody's gonna force me to do anything or like motivate me, so I have to motivate myself. One more challenge I can see within this process is that suppose if I'm just starting and I don't have any job experience or project experience, when I reach out to someone, how am I going to approach them and make them trust me and want to actually have a meeting with me? So do you、yep. have any advice for that? I recommend firstly just check if they're hiring, just understand the environment first, and then when you reach out to say like a co-founder or a founder or maybe even a CTO of a startup, you can actually just start a conversation, like highlight some research from their, you know, looking at their business is a good thing. I wouldn't necessarily Necessarily, just ask them if they've got any jobs. That's what everyone does. Try and take some interest in their business and ask them some questions and be curious and find out 
a little bit more and, and aim to build a relationship. The, the idea here is to build a good relationship and then after that, opportunities will come. But without a relationship, it, there's nothing to, to base it on. Getting a job is kind of like a separate thing, you know, it's like a new skill you need to acquire. Yeah. You really have to like know how to communicate well, how to be a good negotiator. So it really takes time to figure this out. So you're probably going to fail a bunch of times before you actually get your job, which is okay because this is how we learn, you know. You fail and then you adjust uh, your resume and next time you do better. Do you think formal education is really that important when you're switching a career path? I don't think that necessarily the certificate, the degree matters, especially in tech. I think tech is something of an outlier when it comes to that. It really depends on the style of the company that you're applying to. Normally, if you apply to a smaller, more pragmatic, sort of agile growth company or startup, there's less emphasis usually on degrees because fundamentally they're looking for people who can wear multiple hats, think laterally, horizontally, and be very much pragmatic pragmatic rather than theoretical. The other side is it's really like very important to have like a CS degree or a, or a math degree or some engineering type degree because that shows a certain type of thinking. It gives the employer some confidence around like the standard of education and things like that. Sometimes they're more inclined that way. So for a big tech company, that, yeah. that's going to matter, right? <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes not. Sometimes they evaluate candidates proficiency based on experience. But if you've got no experience, then a degree is something that you can leverage with certain organizations. But yeah, you don't have to have a CS degree to go and apply for Facebook or Google or something like that. What sort of problem or weakness do you see the most often in your students? Confidence is the number one thing that I help students with. I think this relates to technology people really not having much of a grasp on social skills a lot of the time. A lot of these people have the skills to do this, have this huge opportunity. They just need to believe in themselves. I think maybe confidence, they need more confidence. You are with other strangers, right? And you just feel nervous and you don't speak English that well. You develop this imposter syndrome, which you need to overcome eventually. I've talked to a bunch of people here on I talk and English is, is actually quite good. So they are ready to get a new job in English, but they lack confidence. And of course, just like, you know, practice interview skills as well. What's your advisor strategies for people who are struggling with content issues? I think the main part of it comes from lack of experience having conversation in that language. You can do a lot of things. You can listen to podcasts, listen to movies, read articles, read books, all in your target language, all in English. And that's going to help. But I, I think for me, like the gold standard, how like the maximum level of learning is achieved is through conversation. Not only does that improve like your overall fluency, it's going to, due to improving your confidence, you'll feel more motivated to continue to progress. It also works on your pronunciation simultaneously because you're hearing those words pronounced correctly by a native speaker. Just be bold and confident. Stop caring that much. And of course, learn. If you make a mistake, you have to take it into account and improve. 这次呢，我是在 iTalki 上认识的这几位老师。iTalki 呢是一个全球性的语言学习社区，就算足不出户，没有语言环境，也可以轻松找到全世界各地的母语外教，一对一的练口语。除了英文之外呢，还包括了日语、法语、韩语、德语等等一百五十多种语言，还可以像我一样去筛选有相应经历的老师。毕竟 iTalki 呢已经在线上语言学习这一块深耕了十五年了，资源可以说是相当的丰富，而且的付费方式也是比较灵活的，上一节课就付一节课的。钱单节课的价格也不会特别贵哦，跟我们以前上学的时候的外教课不一样的是，除了枯燥的什么记单词啊、讲语法，还可以像我一样跟老师们去聊一些很好玩的话题。在获得宝贵的职场经验的同时呢，也练习了英语，这也是我个人觉得体验最好的一点。就像前面 Tom 说的，我们在英文面试中不自信的根源就是因为缺乏经验，只要练习的多了，自然就能大胆的讲出来喽。OK， 那这期视频我自己真的做的非常的开心，也学到了。很多很多，如果大家喜欢这类视频的话，可以弹幕扣一。我以后呢，可以再去邀请一些朋友啊、专家来给大家分享，希望有给到大家有价值的建议吧。下次再见喽，拜拜。